button. Okay, so there's a few things I'm gonna have to do. I'm gonna have to turn the volume down real quick on this new one. Do a quick copy and paste over to this old one. Get them all organized into the chat and then we'll start this uh, episode. Thanks for your patience, everybody. Let's see if I can fit that in there. All alone today. Usually there's a few people that have come into the room by now, but that's okay because we certainly know that I can talk and talk and talk if need be. So I will say, welcome everybody to Hash Church 3.0, episode 23. Uh, let's see how we do here. Johnny B's texting me, which is perfectly on time. Uh, all right. Well, we'll just wait for the friends. I did send out the link yesterday fairly late, so I don't exactly know um, who is going to um, be involved. Looks like things are a little... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're good. What's up, Magma Seeds, Hermano, Jason S, Boulder, The Underhill. Yes, everyone was in the wrong room as I... For whatever reason, I'm not quite sure how to set it up. So when I go, when I create the YouTube live video, that it goes live with the actual Zoom video, it creates a new YouTube video. But uh, welcome, Wade. How are you doing this morning? Uh, I'm good, Marcus. Oh, good. I hear you. Great week so far. How about you? I need to put these on. Probably have. Let's see if I can't get these on. Does everyone hear Wade or is it just me? I'm going to go real quick here. Now we're good, Wade. I, I bet you I can hear you now. I had my speaker set up as my microphone. Ah, uh, yes. I was going to say I couldn't hear you, but I can hear you great now. Thank you. I had a uh, great time at the Patients Out of Time conference this past week, and Colton Turner was one of the presenters. Remember Colton? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How was that? Tell me more. Um, it was excellent. It was uh, Thursday through Saturday. Thursday was on regulations and uh, Obstacles to research. Sat Friday was uh, the latest research. Some pretty amazing papers were presented. And then Saturday was the clinicians. And one of the case presentations was done by Colton about himself. <laughs> That's so awesome. It was. It was great. Especially at the end, they had this Q&A thing for the faculty that presented. And you got all of these distinguished clinicians, many of whom I know, on the Zoom call, and then there's Colton. It was just really far out, man. I think he'll probably be in that crew one of these days. Good morning, Mark. Of course. Yes. Hey guys, how are you? Good. <clears throat> Mark, it was really weird when I just joined, there was this automated recording that came on saying that this is being recorded. Did you hear that too, Wade? Okay. Well, the reason that is, is because usually, uh, yeah, I, I, Usually you guys have been showing up lately and then I go live on YouTube and go recording, but I, I went live and I started recording earlier. I guess that's a legal message to let you know that, hey, if you don't want to be recorded, don't come into the chat room. Yeah, the last little window before you go live says, do you consent to be recorded or something like that? Okay. Let's see. Welcome to the big time, Mark. <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah. like, you know, it, it could be intimidating for people like Sam, right? Maybe that's why he's not here yet. Ah, he's like, ah. fuck that. I'm not going to be recorded. Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Wow. Oh, yeah. Hmm. How are you guys doing? Doing I'm really, really well. Good. I'm still farting around with my. Um, I just want to make sure that I, I sound better. They're all bummed out. They're saying it's uh, grainy. This, I'm listening now to. Now you're better. Time chat room yeah i just changed my microphone from these ones to to my actual microphone so that should be better it won't be quite as bad hopefully the connection comes in i'm actually trying out a new internet service today i just try uh set up my starlink yesterday on the roof there so 
it's brand new it's in beta so i'm just i do have another internet to back it up in case i have problems but uh for now this is uh this is what we're doing and no this is not a recording this is um yeah this is live live with dr mark and uh with wade laughter we're here in hash church i set the link out really late last night as i've been putting my son to bed for the last month um just trying to give my wife a little bit of a break of every single night having to do the same thing and you know sometimes when you work all day that you know your wife is like oh i feel bad you worked all day well so did you you also worked all day with kids which is even harder than working all day at a job so for the last 23 days i've been putting my son to bed and i generally fall asleep with him at around nine o'clock I, I can't stay awake when i put him to bed so uh yeah if it was a little bit of uh but that gets you up at like four in the morning right <laughs> Well, we definitely get up pretty early. I'm not going to lie. I've been up for hours right now. Not quite four, but probably, you know, a little bit, uh, just a little bit after 6 a.m. So that's Yeah, once good. the birds start singing, especially here in the springtime, it, it becomes difficult because um, it's just, it's such a great thing to hear birds in the morning. I mean, I love it. Yeah, I'm but in the same boat. With, with, uh, with some people who sleep with their windows open, it's just, it's so loud that. There's no way you can get back. It's true. Sleep. We uh, both both in the morning and at dusk, the birds are yeah. so loud here at dusk. It's incredible. They're flying around from tree to tree. I'm really right smack in uh, in a in a forest, so it's uh, no shortage of incredible birds. In fact, my son found a bird yesterday. A little baby had fallen out of his nest in one of our hedges, and uh, yeah, he. Found them, saved them. Helped birds them. aren't real. They yeah, birds aren't birds. real. I've heard, I've heard birds of this. Birds are some kind of alien robots that fly around. <laughs> well, this yeah, one looks really real. Us. <laughs> yeah, right. It looked real though. I'm telling you, I, I know they're not real and all. I don't want to be uh, laughed at or whatnot. But where did that come from? How did we get into that? How did it? I, I've understand all these wild conspiracies, but when did we like? Who, sh who was like? Birds aren't real. Like, where did that one come from? <laughs> not an ornithologist for sure <laughs> yeah. what's on josh hey guys how's it going josh can you hear me i can hear you it's just uh we got uh, double josh there for a quick second ah nice double josh rutherford nonetheless all right well we got josh rutherford and then we got dragonfly earth medicine oh i thought there's the other one coming too so we got three joshes Oh snap! You guys are the uh, the Josh party minorities here in the in the in the room. How's it going, man? How are you guys doing? A couple of live living soil guys in the house. I'm doing really really good. The farm's looking amazing. We're about ready to get a week of rain, and all the plants now that we're in a waxing moon phase are there's enough heat at night and enough you know, warmth during the day that the plants are kind of doing their Fibonacci doubling process. Yeah. So we're getting a lot of growth right now and it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I, you know, John brought me these monster plants, just, just a couple of them, you know, two or three of them the other day. And uh, they've only been on my deck for a couple of days, but I'm saying, I'm thinking they've grown about a foot to a foot and a half, these bushes. They were just big round bushes. And now they've got these, you know, these piece, these giant, just coming all off the top and it's I haven't grown in so long you know I'm so I, I envy what you guys do and I love growing and I love getting my fingers dirty and I love the whole concept and idea I just personally have not had a lot of time to do it so um, good old Johnny B shows up with some plants and I'm back in the game and uh, it's fun right there's like this the nervousness of wanting the plants to be healthy and happy and give them everything they need while just being like, oh my God, I got to give these plants attention and love and focus. And even three monsters, I am uh, I really have to make time for because they, you know, they drink 15 to 20 gallons of, of water every day. Like they're thirsty. It's like your son, they have needs. <laughs> they have needs, they have needs and their needs must come before my needs. And sometimes you fall asleep with them, don't you? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. 
I was on my roof yesterday and I was happy to see them poking up above the, the second roof. I could see them, you know, they're, they've got to be over 10 feet tall right now. So only Johnny B would just bring me three 10 foot tall plants in the back of his truck. And I'm in the meantime, I'm like, please tell me you didn't put those into the truck yourself. Cause he's, he's got a disc thing going on right now. He's got some pretty major pain. He was in and out of the hospital. And I just, the last thing I want John to do is uh, destroy himself through kindness. So luckily he got his neighbors, Mike and Hetty to put the plants in the, um, in the back of the truck. And I got my 17 year old son, he Tosh, as we call him, uh, to, uh, to lift out the, uh, <laughs> to lift out these plants, you know, Johnny B style, he didn't wait for them to get like dry. He, he moved them like fully, fully like 80 plus pounds per, <laughs> per plant. <laughs> Uh, but that's what's great about having a 17 year old son for any of you whose son has not reached that age yet man you can't you can't imagine how amazing it is when your son just can lift and carry everything no wonder people back in the day on farms just put their kids to work I mean it's funny that we got all into this thing like oh they're making kids make shoes and it's like child labor it's like have you ever grown up on a farm because child labor is how that shit operates <laughs> And in some cases in Ontario, I know I've heard this story many times. There's like, you know, women who have 20 kids. I'm sure you've heard that, Marcus. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 20 and 23 children on the farm and stuff. And it's just, it's a true mind blower. Definitely. It's your crew, right? It's your crew. I can definitely say Sky's 24 now. And he's a complete and total force of nature. And we, we joke around about being um, strong because we're really into being strong but then we have this inner sasquatch strength that you can like tap into when you really need to go farther than your actual strength we 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 and you amazing and 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 now hit with his with Sierra on the farm, you know, and, uh, and Kendall. And then we have this amazing, you know, early 20, we have amazing, you know, small crew that really is uh, amazing the work they can do. So yeah, it's, it's amazingly valuable. That's awesome. I don't doubt that whatsoever that uh, this guy is a force to be reckoned with 24 years old now too. Hey, that's uh, unbelievable. My daughter just turned 20 and my son, will turn 18 in September and my other son will turn seven in August. So that's so awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, um, you know, I just feel really blessed. I just feel really, really blessed to have, have them around and have them be so charged up about our lifestyle and everything that we're doing. And, you know, it's, it's obviously their calling in life as well. Um, yeah. So That's one awesome. thing I just wanted to bring up on the show today, which is not about cannabis, but it is about environments is I'd love to bring attention to the Ferry Creek watershed and the forestry that's going on over there. Um, there's uh, only 2%, you know, old growth left in British Columbia, virgin old growth forest left at all. And it's on occupied lands, First Nations lands, Ferry Creek watershed outside of Port Renfro on Vancouver Island. The local government here in NBC is the NDP and they are uh, raising the, the cutting of four, by 43% of old growth forests. And there's only 2.3% old growth even left in BC. So they're, they're, they're basically out to attack and and murder the rest of our intact environment in in america in the united states most all of the old growth is already in protected forests there's really no that's not already in national parks so
there's tree sitters. They're first tree sitters of people that are sitting in trees for over 30 years. There's, there's activist people sitting in trees trying to stop. Loggers are laughing at them. They're stealing their stuff. They're, 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 ta they're taking down their camps. The RCMP are basically private mercenaries for this, for this land occupation and for this type of big business. They're out cutting 1500 year old trees right next to people sitting in trees. They're taking chainsaws to, I, mean, I don't know if anyone's ever smelt a yellow cedar but a yellow cedar doesn't actually, doesn't grow in, in, in Oregon. It doesn't grow in California or Washington. It's like a Alaska and British Columbia thing. That the smell, the incense, like that, that the odor, that, that there's something totally otherworldly about the yellow cedar. And um, I just really want to activate people to make phone calls to John Horgan's office and to Katrine Conroy and to the BC RCMP and to all other people that they find in their own network, the Teal Jones group who's doing the cutting and, and let the, the, the people know that we're not okay with losing our last intact environments. Once these trees are logged, they'll never be replaced. The, these environments will never be replaced. They're, 14 and 18 feet across, which are really, really big for cedars. Where Craig is down in the, in, 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 in the Redwoods and, and over in the Sierra Nevadas with the Sequoias, there's trees up here that rival those Redwoods. There, there's 300 foot tall cedars in this forest that's being ready to, to get cut, which are among the tallest trees in the world like the Redwoods. So. It's all I can think about right now. I, I feel extremely passionate as well as my family. It, it, right now in British Columbia, wood prices are through the roof. So everywhere you go in the forest right now, you're hearing chainsaws and trees falling. It's like a genocide on cedar trees. The cedar trees are so valuable right now that private land owners are just raking down their land. Private logging companies are raking down their land. And it's, and, and raw log exports is another thing for people to be aware of. Raw log exports, there's something like 230 cubic, three, 230 million cubic feet of raw log exports a year coming out of British Columbia. We're talking about massive ships with just raw logs th thrown on them. So am I talking about no logging? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I understand that there's a place for logging and, and, and sustainable harvesting. And I, and I know that, and I understand living in wooden houses and I get that. What we're talking about is logging an intact environment that'll never be replaced. When you, when you talk about beautiful, when you talk about British Columbia, it's beautiful British Columbia or supernatural British Columbia, but the government is sanctioning the destruction of our environment and it's not okay with us. And I just really want to encourage people to, to step up and to call, look at our story and make phone calls if you can, if, if you feel like you have time to make those phone calls, to let the, the people know that our voices have been heard. Thank you so much for letting me say that. Um, it's really important to me and I appreciate Hash Church. I appreciate the family. Part of our activism is in cannabis. Part of our activism is in psychedelics. And another part of our activism is in saving our lands because without our lands, there's no health. And, and just one more time, the RCMP are targeting indigenous people on their lands. It, it's it's the, the work, it's everything that you read in your history books happening right now in the forest. It's not history, it's present day occupation. Thank you so much. Thanks for sharing that, Josh. Definitely pretty fucked up to be thinking about these trees just uh, that take hundreds of years to be produced to grow into the, the the magnificent beings that they are and then to just have like chainsaws you know the just I, i'm a i'm a 
I've lived on my property for 11 years and I've never cut a tree. I live in a neighborhood where people are obsessed with cutting trees because they want to have a view. And I like trees in my view. I wonder if these people, when they're done with getting rid of all the trees in their view, if we'll also drain the ocean so we can see the bottom better. I don't know, I hope not. Uh, but it does seem a little bit mental in my neighborhood T today. And I'm happy to say I only noticed this a couple Sundays ago and it's really not probably that big of a deal. But every Sunday I hear chainsaws in my neighborhood, every single Sunday. So I guess, you know, some lady got onto the Lions Bay board and she passed a little ordinance and now it's Sundays are quiet Sundays. So you can't go like leaf blow and turn on your, you can't turn on your chainsaw. The noise was the least of my worry. It was, and for any of you that have ever watched my videos and I have over a thousand of them on YouTube, you'll remember random chainsaw guy that I used to always mention because anytime I went out onto my deck to make a video, any time of day or night, some motherfucker would have a chainsaw going like two seconds. I'd turn the camera on, I'd be like, hey, everybody. Yeah. Like, what the yeah. <laughs> we missed that, but it was kind of perfect, I think. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah I yeah, I'll just, you know, some of these native women, like these elders that are getting arrested right now, like uh, have, are, are were, were They've had to deal with laws where only no more than four indigenous people could gather together. What, these native elders have lived through laws where they could not gather. We're not talking about COVID. No, we're talking about you can't be more than four native people at once or you're against the law. What? Has, and, and, and also residential schools, you know, where they're taken out of their lands. And, and to maid speak English and to disconnect them from the land. These are the people getting arrested today and yesterday for protecting the last remaining old growth in British Columbia. Yeah, it's pretty fucked up. We should uh, welcome uh, Colin and Craig from Alpenglow into the room. They just showed up. How are you guys doing? Doing really well, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us, and uh, thanks for sharing that, Josh. It's uh, always important to, you know, voice as much as we can uh, to all communities so they can, uh, you know, join and be a larger voice together. Um, nice to see you, Craig. Always a big fan of your work out there. Thanks for being on with us. Yes, good morning. And thank you, Josh, for rolling that out. I've been following along in the stories and doing uh, a small share of reposting and just trying to bring some awareness. And this is so real and it happens here in our, our community as well. Um, those of you that have driven the 101 through the uh, Humboldt Mendoz state line, like we're battling Caltrans there because they want to widen the road so trucks could go bigger trucks and f could travel through there and faster. And then right now it's like, we call it the Redwood Curtain because they have to, a certain length of semi needs to unhook and get put on by a little tractor uh, semi to pull it through there. But it also slows everyone down to 40 miles an hour. And, and it's like, it's almost like going to church for a minute. Like we go 65 forever. And then it's like, just slow down and, and appreciate what we have. Um, but yeah, Josh, you, you brought up a lot of valid points. Like you're seeing, I live in a wooden house and these fur beams in my house came from my land and I cut those down. Um, we have, our land personally was, was pretty hammered by the loggers and grew up all at one time. Um, there's a couple seed trees left here or there. So we are taking the chainsaws out and doing a bunch of management because what's grown back has grown back as, as mother nature didn't really plan. And in time it would correct itself. You know, it's, it's choking out some of the smaller species and they're falling and, and we have this dead and dying thing happening and, you know, uh, bringing back the carbon sequester, sequestered carbon back into its own ecosystem. But with the fire danger we have right now, we can't wait for mother nature 
So we do have to step in and do some of our own management practices um, just in our little footprint here. Um, but we are doing, we're chipping it and we're, we're using that to build soil and so forth. But I think those of you that are listening that are hearing the talk about trees, I think you really have to have critical thinking. And I, so much of that critical thinking has gone out the window these days. It's, it's with Corona and all these other things, folks have just thrown the critical thinking out. And it's, it's platforms like this that help us bring these minds together and, and share our thoughts. And thank you, Marcus, time and time again for holding space for all this community and everyone here. Um, we appreciate you um, for what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate the kind words. Very nice to uh, start it off with some realness this morning, you know, like uh, I personally absolutely love visiting old growth forests. I have a cedar forest, a standing cedar forest that's just up the road, uh, just up past Whistler. We have an ancient cedar forest and they're pretty big trees, 20 to 25 feet in diameter. They're impressive. They take your breath away. Of course, Tofino, Mears Island, um, some really beautiful trees out that way as well. And it's just such a shame to, to, to see them be cut down. And even for people that were here, you know, back in the day when logging was happening in the 50s and the 60s, it was really just one tree that would hit the, that would hit the truck at a time. Now you see these logging trucks. Yeah, like one tree for multiple trucks even. Um, oh, look at that. Nice little treats, Sharon. Oh, yeah. You know, I hope Brian shows up from Best Friend Farms because he's been doing these incredible like cookies and like donuts and like just kind of like they look really like a treat that you would eat. And uh, I meant to mention it last week, but we got sucked so far down the rabbit hole of sensory science uh, that it, he by the time I went to go see if he was in the room, he had bounced. He had some problems with his... Um, with his internet. So hopefully he comes back in. I'm about to puff a little dab of some 120 micron strawberry banana. This shit. This is definitely what dreams are made of right here. Let me tell you, if this right here, this is literally how we could stop these motherfuckers from cutting down trees, because I'm telling you a couple of heroic dabs of this and there's just no way that those people are going to decide that, yeah, this is in my best interest. And wow, as humans, we get caught up, like you could, you could just feel the polarity, the tension between a logger and an activist. You can, you can just, the way we just have these different mentalities. And I can't help but feel that the compelling of speech is getting us into a very dangerous position here in life as we start to compel speech. There are certain things we can talk about and there are certain things we cannot talk about. And if we talk about those things, we will ostracize, we will be ridiculed and we will be punished. And I'm not necessarily talking about any one particular thing. I just, you know, for a long time, this Jordan Peterson guy was like, listen, this isn't about these issues. It's about compelling speech and controlling speech. And we are now getting into a level of compelling, of compelled speech that maybe we've never seen before in the history of our species. And um, I hope one day that it doesn't become, you know, insane to talk about saving trees. I hope one day that they don't decide to ostracize us and make us look like uh, conspiracy freaks because we think that trees produce oxygen and that we want some of them to be alive because I see a lot of things getting cast into that sort of, well, we can just disregard that because we have this argument against that. Plus we've compelled speech. So they're not really allowed to talk about that anymore anyway. Freaks me out a little bit. In the meantime, I'm gonna have a little dab. Marcus, I, uh, I kind of resemble that remark that you just made about if we had a few more light ups of strawberry banana. Just planted one. I don't know if you guys can see it up there on my big flat. Yeah, we, right on. We planted it into native soils. Um, I've, I've been starting to utilize this technique of uh, trenching with a, a, a trencher, making just a little cut because we have where we have clay and shale, it is so compacted. Like it's ridiculous um, from some of these logging sites. So I've, I've tried this technique where I'm trenching down and then 
putting the wood chip and uh, inoculated straw and building soils that way. And then putting, putting a little bit of locally sourced nursery stock soil just around the, the plant itself so it can go out and give it itself a minute. Um, and uh, it's, it's coming along nicely. And I, I'm excited to see how this one comes out. It's the first time I've done it as a light depth. I've done it as full term where you have more time for those roots to get established and tap into the biology. Light depth is an interesting one to uh, do in native soils. Um, as some of you know, it, it takes just an extra minute. You have to be a little more patient, but once it kicks in, it's, it's phenomenal. Cheers. Uh, does your trench drain water or does it hold water when you make it, Craig? Yeah, so uh, Josh, you've been here and down at our Huckleberry Flat Place, the lower place that we actually sold, that was more of a shale finger of the, of the mountain. And there, it actually functioned really nicely. And that's where we went a bit deeper and we put a lot of wood chip in the bottom of that one. So it would be a sponge and capture the water before it just drained down through the shale. In this one, I had a problem even with a trencher getting through the, the hard pan clay. Like it was just like bouncing. Um, so this one, I really feel it's gonna hold water and we are being super, so it's the opposite now. So instead of trying to create a sponge at the bottom and hold water that was passing through, this one will be using just minute water. And then a bunch of this wood chip that we've, we've recently made, we've put in the pathways and, and along the edges. And actually part of the technique is prepping the flat before we even operate the trencher. So um, sometimes if we have the time, we would um, put down a loose fill straw, kind of the Ruth Stout method. So loose fill straw, and then two inches or so of uh, raw manure, let that sit over the winter, then trench, and then you're bringing the native over it like a lasagna layer. And, you know, I'm not one for using mechanized uh, tools, but sometimes when you're on the mountain, you don't have a choice and you bring them in one time and then you're good. But the tailings of the trencher are really nice. It's really nice structure to it. And it, it, it makes a really nice lasagna layer. Now up here, um, we didn't have the time. So we did the, we did the straw, wood chips, and then we let the chickens out on it for two weeks. And the chickens went through and got all the hay seeds out and you know, uh, inoculated with their, with their manure. Um, and then we trench. And then when we bring that native soil on top, it keeps that clay tailing from becoming anaerobic. Um, and that's also really important with the, the manures as well. So now we have that um, on top and then we will come through and probably put a really light layer of wood chip. Um, and then I also picked up some spawn blocks from Mushroom Mike um, and I'll be inoculating that. The pathways first and then with a the pathway being like that, thick with uh, wood chip, we will uh, inoculate that and then we'll come in with um, some compost tea and just dump it and dump it and dump it and let that be the biology spread out in on there you can spread that on your aisles you know little seed of some biology from different places and over the year your aisle is creating the indigenous microorganisms because when you use rice to create indigenous microorganisms you're going to get a lot of trichoderma you know the green molds that come on under heavy and, and trichoderma and, and and no one's actually testing the species on the rice so when you use more locally sourced raw materials to build your indigenous microorganisms, then you're gonna get more diverse biology from your region because rice doesn't grow in your region. So how is biology gonna have the intelligence to propagate itself? Only certain things will propagate itself. So really by using wild grasses and leaves 
and your indigenous soils coming up, manures, mushroom blocks. These are all things that grow in the region and have a more complex carbohydrate, a more complex carbon for biodiversity, which is really what we're looking for. So I really love that you know, you're know you taking on the aisle tech and that, that's not a word, but it, maybe it is now, but you know, the aisles are, there's so much earth that can come from there for the next year. And, and I love you, Melanie, congratulations. You are amazing. Thank you for your passion and uh, you know, and your, um, your completion of your uh, education. That's really a really big deal. We all love you so much and you know that. Well, thank you, Josh, I appreciate it. It's quite an accomplishment and it feels amazing um, to be done. And um, it amaz it's amazing just to wanna to keep going too, right? It's gonna be uh, really neat to see what, you know, what, what the future holds for all of us. And thank you to my husband for the support. <laughs> oh, thank you. Have a good time, yeah. bye. And of course, the two beautiful girls. Yeah, of course. You know, one, one thing that Melanie is going to be going on and, and teaching is public speaking. And all of us realize what an important tool that is. You know, we can have these regenerative tools, we can have these political views, we can have this activism, but without being able to speak and deliver it properly and accurately, um, we'd be lost. So I sure appreciate her. And, and more so just... Um, to find what's inside of ourselves and be able to express that authentically in our way. So me, me expressing myself the way that Melanie does is different than the way that you would or that Josh would, or, you know, it's, it's just encouraging people to trust who they are and trust that they can express themselves in a way that, that is like them. original thought is um, lacking these days. So that's why it's important to turn off your electronics every once in a while and go experience yourself. Go experience your surroundings, go experience your cannabis, go touch your soil, go be in tune with intuition. Because intuition and, and, and feelings, it, it's, it's, it's learned. It's, it's a, it's a muscle. It's, it's something that you, that you get, you have to, you have to teach yourself. I mean, people that are remote viewers or people that are intuitives, they, they work on it, you know? So, you know, let's work on using our voice. Let's work on our original thought. What's authentic to us. It's important to be part of a group too, because community is part of our, our, our importance, but, you know, bringing original thought to it is extremely important. Johnny B's in the house. Dab time. Johnny B in the house. I would say what Josh was just saying is to spend time with the sublime because the sublime is humbling and you will, we'll all be a little bit, we, uh, the way I put it the other day to a friend is, you know what, we'll be a lot less dicks if we're just, we'll be a lot nicer if we can just share time with this humility. And that is to stare the sublime in the face, go jump off a mountain, go snowboard down a mountain, go spend time in a garden, go out in the middle of the ocean and feel how insignificant you are because um, yeah, it's, it's okay to be humbled. The world could use more of it. Good morning, everybody. We're growing hemp right now from Daryl Hudson and uh, in Planta and You know, the Vavilov, does everyone know who Nikolai Vavilov is? Uh, just curious. But anyway, in the, in the 1920s, Nikolai Vavilov traveled the world collecting cannabis seeds and also other seeds and created the Vavilov Institute. Now, he was one of the four, foremost genetic seed collectors of the world at the time. But over the course of the years, he became ostracized by the community and eventually jailed, and then eventually starved to death in jail. 
Now, the Vavilov Institute still exists and has lots of seeds. Um, also, uh, you know, that combined with the historical hemp of China, um, we're, 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 we're looking at, at hemp in a different way right now because yeah, high CBD is super important. It's an obvious medicine, um, but food and fiber coming out of hemp is gonna be what saves us from the forest industry or potentially Bill Gates, uh, you know, whole meat thing or whatever to save the, the earth and stuff. Like these seeds are the largest seeds I've ever seen and they grow up to 18 feet tall and have giant stalks and they can outproduce the forest industry in cellulose and fiber by I don't know the number four to five times, you know, they way outproduce timber sales when it comes to biomass and when it comes to say pellet fuel or campcretes and stuff. So we are putting our best foot forward to continue these genetics outside of CBD, outside of medicinal and, and continuing the work of food and fiber hemp, you know, because this, it, this is part of what makes cannabis the master plant that it is you know you don't become a master plant in evolution without having you know thousands of uses and uh that's what this plant offers and and we know that um so i feel really blessed right now to be able to stand in the presence of thousands of years and, and hundreds i think every cannabis plant is a, is a is a thousand year old you know multi-generational creation whether it's a hybrid or from an ancient stock but being able to reinvigorate that ancient stock is pretty phenomenal and i'm going to go grab the seeds real quick so you can see the size of them i did do a post of them and some people saw them but i like right. that we'll check that out i love that that's that's what that plant can i feel like I feel like Sam showed me the biggest and the smallest seeds I've ever seen in my life. And he did it like all within the same like 30 second span of time. And, and the smallest ones I uh, got from Kashmir and the biggest ones from Yunnan. But I did work with the Vavilov for five, six years. And uh, I had access to every seed they had. But did they have access right. to every did, seed you had? Did you no. have access to seeds? Let's see that look. Let me get this in my hand. Are these the walnut seeds? Yeah. Let me see if I can. Should I get a scale? Yeah, I'm curious. The oh, biggest yeah. I've ever biggest I ever food. had were twelve to one gram. I love that Sam has a reference point. Like just think just think of that for one second, okay? He's going to weigh these monster seeds, and Sam says to him, Oh, the biggest ones I ever had were twelve to one gram. Who fucking knows that? You know, I, I don't I don't know how many how much my seeds weigh particularly, but I know how many fit on a teaspoon of my legacy genetic. You know, so I know I can take a teaspoon and that's about a hundred. And so you're it, like, it makes, you're that's like a lid. That's an Alpenglow lid. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a spoon. That's awesome. Very cool. I can't wait to see how much these seeds weigh. I want to see how many he gets in a gram. The ones Sam put in my hand literally were like small walnuts. I, I remember get, laughing when I first saw them. I was like, this is ridiculous. And those were not the most insane seeds Sam ever put in my hand because the most insane seeds he ever put in my hand were like from some burial from like 2000 plus years ago. He was like, check these out. And I was kind of like, what? What are these? Like, they look really old. This is from the 100th anniversary of the Vavilov Institute. Oh, nice. How old were those seeds that you had from like the burial? Uh... Oh, those are, uh, of, I think, 1700 years old, <laughs> almost 2000 years old. 
Those seeds were the seeds. That was the only cannabis thing I ever held in my hand that I really like the hair stood up on the back of my neck when I realized what they were. And of course, you know, Sam just throws them at me like they're nothing. I'm just like, what? Vavilov uh, Institute folks took me over to the Hermitage Museum where the seeds were from the, uh, uh, it was from the uh, Roshinko uh, burial tomb where he, Roshinko's the one who dug it up and they found uh, these, you know, uh, 1,700, 2,000 year old seeds. And they gave me eight of them that they found in a little, little leather pouch buried uh, under the ground with all kinds of other cool treasures from the Scythians. Did you try and germinate them, Sam? Oh yeah, so sure. I've got them going right now in my backyard. No, they they were completely dried out, and uh, you know there was no oil in them at all anymore. They they were beneath though. Maybe maybe they were okay when they dug them up because it was in the whole tomb was buried in ice for all this time. But what happened was uh, they stored at the museum for gee whiz, 20, 30 years before they gave them to me. And they were almost 2,000 years old, so. <laughs> I wanna see these uh, seeds, Josh. Are you weighing those seeds over there? Oh. I think we just realized Josh still lives in the days of paranoia and his scale is out in an olive barrel, like in the back 40. <laughs> I got to go dig it up. It's funny. I'll be we back within the hour. Triple beam. <laughs> it was pretty funny. If these hills could talk. Yeah, man, that's awesome. So Dr. Mark, what's going on, man? How did the uh how did the test go with the uh I believe you you were telling me you had THCV and uh or C B D V. I I can't remember what can what novel cannabinoid you're you're you you got a new line on that you're trying to to work with what what, well, what company was that and what what cannabinoid yeah so it was a company that was selling uh thcv isolate and um uh the company um is called snapdragon cbd and they're out of tennessee and they were on the adam dunn show and adam or adam's guy called me up and had me come on the show real quickly a couple Fridays ago and they just happened to be on and they're like, Hey, we got THCV isolate. I was like, Ooh, really? Wow. Let's get some of that. See what that's like. So yeah, I ordered some. Yeah. So it, 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 it is pretty pure, but it's totally Delta eight configured, right? So it's, it's not Delta nine THCV. It's, it's Delta eight. So it makes me think that they're just converting it from from cbdv so cbdv like cbd makes an isolate and you could uh convert that isolate over to the thc form and if you start with cbdv you make thcv so obviously yeah this is like what people are doing out in the marketplace now people have a lot of access to like large amounts of cbdv i guess so i mean i yeah i mean well maybe not large amounts marcus but they're able to make isolate from from distillate um i i guess i mean wh where else does it come from i mean the other thing is that um i don't know if you guys are uh, on future 4200 but there's this fella <laughs> iron trap there who's uh, actually testing a lot of delta 8 products and finding a whole soup of really nasty chemicals in there, not only the starting materials. And what happens when they, so what they do is they, they take CBD and they treat it with acid and that converts it over to THC. Um, but um, 
it also unzips the molecule and and rips the the terpene portion of CBD off the ring and makes this compound called olivetol. And you'll know olivetolic acid is the, the, the precursor to all the cannabinoids in the plant. And olivetol is not something that you want to be consuming. And, um, and so this guy is out buying samples of If they're less pure, you'd think that, you know, they would just throw that away, but they end up in things like gummies where, you know, yeah, the consumer is going to be tasting the gummy, but they're not knowing that the crap that's in there is only like about 50 or 60% pure, meaning that there's 40% other crap in there. And he's finding things like phthalates. In one sample, he actually found dioxins, and dioxins is a really... A toxic class of, of molecules. And to make dioxins, my gosh, they must have just a toxic soup of, of stuff in there. And these folks are just hemp processors. They're not, um, they're not chemists like me. And they, they, they don't understand that what they're making is they're making a chemical mixture and then thinking that it's okay to put into uh, and safe to put into products. It's clearly not their focus. Their focus is to find an exploit in the system and to be able to make money where they thought they previously couldn't. And it's been the, it's been the name of the game since the beginning of hemp being grown in the U.S. Because it, you guys always... Be, though, it, 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 it could be done clean and pure that there's ways that you of can course, make reaction of course really but that's clean. not your when that's not your focus when your focus is just to find the exploit to make money these are the right. repercussions right and you see that they banned it in colorado and i think one of the reasons why they banned it in colorado is because the delta nine lobby is so strong in colorado and certainly the colorado is one of the leading states of you know regulating the industry here in the u.s but I guess the real disappointing thing is that like when you go to these Delta eight markets, they're in all the cannabis unfriendly states like Mississippi and Tennessee and Alabama. And none of those states have cannabis programs because they sell Delta eight cartridges down at the gas station. So why do they need cannabis? Right. And, and again, Marcus, when you look at so the guy who's on, um, Future 4200, if the uh, uh, watchers or the hash church people need to know, there's a guy named uh, Iron Trap. That's the guy you want to look for. And there's a couple threads in there that talks about him analyzing commercial products. And he's actually looking for producers to say, hey, if you guys think you have a clean product, send it to me. I'll test it for you tell you what's in there and i guess some people again that's where the interaction goes bad he'll tell them you got all this crap in there you better change and they're just like fuck you you know and that's where it ends so so it, listen you should invite him on to hash church oh, if you man. get a chance i it, it, well you you know the way 4200 works no one really knows who the guy is now i can tell can you come just, on like sam though yeah, he, he, he's kind of like Sam. So, Sam, you probably know this guy. He says he's been working in yeah, I'll give you his uh, phone number and address so everybody can <laughs> get out to he, he says he's been working in <laughs> cannabinoid science for 30 or 40 years. And when you look at the content of his posts, you realize this guy is is no joke. Right, Colin? He is no joke. Yeah, he no totally doubt. Knows what he really knows the stuff. There's yeah. a lot of haters on 4200, so it's a very interesting forum. But um, science most of is like the art community, though. There's tons of haters, you know. But yeah, everyone most, talking talking to future 4200? through the the weight of unknown, you know. It's called Future um, but, 4200. It's a website, and you can go there and look and just look at like I think the thread that I'm thinking of is something like there's a safe, compliant way to make Delta Eight, and I think most of this chatter happened back in March. And after that, there was a lot of edicts that came out about Delta 8, including this ban in Colorado. So who knows if, again, him 
going out and testing some of these products that are in this unregulated marketplace help the FDA and DEA actually sort out, okay, well, what are we going to do here? You know, and I think very clearly, it seems like there's like about more than what, two dozen states now, Colin, that have banned Delta yeah, so that was that's kind of my next question. And like, do, all right, so because of this chemistry and this toxicologist that's really, you know, looking into this, the, the you know, do you believe that's kind of, uh, you know, the reasoning behind the, the, the regulation of Delta 8? And do you believe that this is going to continue? And, and do you believe it should continue? More importantly? Well, he's, he's really getting down on, on producers that don't have in-house yeah. analytics to basically put some type of quality control mechanism on what they're making. Hammer. You could use a hammer to knock in a little pack or you could use a big freaking sledgehammer. So I think yeah. a lot of these people are using a big freaking sledgehammer and they're busting the molecule apart back into a Livitol and some other degradation species. I think parasimine comes out of that and there's a few other things, but it's interesting because again, he's just looking for stuff that's in the marketplace and, and all the producers are like scared of this guy because he's got the sophistication and the analytical instrumentation. And Sam, I bet you a dollar to a donut that you know who this dude is. He's totally anonymous in this forum, but um, he's been in cannabinoid science for a real long time. And I can tell you that everything that he posts, I read it almost, it took me about two days worth of reading just to get through March 21st of that single post. Because there's and like- Anybody there's who sends me 9.95, Nine euros and ninety-five cents. I'll send you his address, his phone number, his social security number, his bank account number. Yeah. Well, the other thing that, that, that made him, the other thing that made him quite unpopular is he said that he's putting a binder together and you're going to send it to the DEA and the Feds, and you know that just is oh instant hot button. You know, with a lot of people, this guy's a douche. He's a snitch. You well, know, fuck it's this guy. obvious if, if he could find things that are wrong with the substances being sold to consumers, a whistle needs to be blown, period. Yes, and he's he's the guy that's doing it. And he says he's doing it because, A, his friends are being poisoned. People like that he knows are being bringing things to him and saying, hey, can you look at this? He looks at it and says, there's poison in here. So that's one thing. And the other thing is he claims that there's a, a safe and efficient process to make this and you need internal analytics to, um, to tell the quality of your products. Look, Marcus, I ask you all the time, Marcus will show a nice piece of hash like that hash meteor he showed last week. And I'll say, hey, what's the, what's the cannabinoid numbers on that? How do you know what it is you're making if you can't test what it is you're making? So I think it calls for in-house analytics, but it also calls for a higher level of competency than just a bunch of cowboys down south making this stuff in their freaking uh, Also, too, Mark, to be honest, warehouse. I think one of the main emphasis behind banning it in many states is the fact that it is It's like, what fucking, what textbook did you read? Go read Paul Malberg. Go read the people who actually figured out cannabinoid biosynthesis. It ends at Delta-8 THC, okay? Or I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Delta-9. It doesn't go to Delta-8, right? So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people on record who say that Delta-8 is, is found in trace amounts in the plant. And I laugh at that. I think that's funny. I'm, I've never seen Not it. Not true. Hey, hey, I wanted to cut to Josh. I, I wanted to cut to Josh because I saw he had 13 seeds to a gram, but then he went off camera and he found some bigger ones and came back yeah. with 12 per gram. Here it, it is, is. Here it is. It's, it's a tie. Are those from Yunnan? Well, it's it's a combination. It's a combination of the Vavilov and the Chinese. Yeah, it is. I think it is from Yunnan. 
which has I, the I, most I, biodi the most biodiversity I, in all I've of China. I've been everywhere around the world looking at cannabis seeds. Yunnan were the biggest I found. Look at 12 seeds, 102. Come on now. I'll find more. I'll make it a <laughs> I, am I am in Canada, so you'd have to ask about that. You know, you'd have to ask. Yeah, I'd love to see if there's pine tar. Oh, because British Columbia is famous for that. Okay. Now, my but, small seeds were 800 plus to the gram. Wow. That's insane. Well, what was that from? Was that tropical? I collected it in Well, those seeds, I think, are the answer to saving the forest, I, th I believe, you know, so that's what I'm excited about. I know Which that when I walk for saving the forest. That one. That's what's for saving the forest. The big ones or the small ones? The big ones. What I'm saying is the big ones are because in this case, and maybe the small ones make giant trees too. I just don't know. I just know that these particular seeds are very large and they also produce some of the largest hemp plants ever you know that you'll see they're 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 a the large stock they really don't flower it's not a big flower plant it's a fiber and food seed thing so i believe that's going to be saving the forest industry because when you walk in an old growth forest you're walking on four to five feet of trees that have been down for a thousand years there's no man-made forest that'll ever ever make it to that and it's especially in a fire zone. I mean, if you wanted to create a nice forest in a fire zone, you would have to cut the trees down, which I don't agree with, but you'd have to cut them down. Then you'd have to buck them up and then you'd have to cut them, slice them in half and then put them on the forest floor. Otherwise you're just stealing soil. So like when you walk in an old growth forest, the purpose of the trees growing really close to themselves is so they fall and if you want to speed up that process and you have to fall them put them on the ground and not take them out otherwise you'll ne there'll never be another large forest there there's only so much dirt there's only so many needles that can fall so that's what's really important when you walk in a, a thousand year old forest you're walking on four to five feet of moss and humus and that's what makes us a humus being. You know, we're humus beings when we're from the earth, when we believe in natural immunity. That's when we're- Carcasses of dead trees, right? Thank you, yes. That's what makes us carbon-based microbial humus beings. Well, and, and, I, I and thought that I was that, stardust what makes that responsible. What, 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 what makes that really happen, Josh? It's fungi, right? It's the wood decay fungi that decay- exactly. So there's stuff called white rot and brown rot. And when it hits white rot, it leaves brown behind. And when it hits brown rot, it leaves white behind. But yeah, those fungi have figured out ways to completely mineralize this the content of the rotten wood. Yeah, Actually, and it, start, it starts with bacteria. Bacteria lead the way, but then fungi come in after that. And all those rotten trees that you find are, yeah, just the tops of what you're talking about, that layer of humus that goes back for centuries of, of, of and, fallen and wood. That, and that fungi is here to save humanity. When I go to Oregon, Washington, or California, it's very difficult to find polypores. It's very difficult to find polypores because there's no trees rotting everything's managed there's no branch to rot you've robbed the forest of fungi and you've robbed the humanity of the fungi amazingly so 
It takes those dead and dying forests, those nasty fire forests are what saves our life. It might be that they want to cut down the old growth forest because when someone walks into an old growth forest, their life has changed forever. They were, oh my God, what's that? Oh my God, the resonance. Oh my God, everything's intact. Oh my God, owls. Did you hear, honey, ravens, what's going on? What's happening? I've never seen life like this. Yeah, we're losing the diversity. So it's very important that we put branches on the ground and let them rot. It makes greenery. It makes greenery. You, you take the branches away, you lose the greenery. I've seen forests green in the summer. You know, it's possible. The only way it's possible is mulch love. You got to over mulch the system and that's three branches. So I think that's mulch love. Yeah, Josh. And one thing I want to add to what he was talking about when we're, <clears throat> when we're cutting our firewood for the, for the season, we'll leave behind a little stack as an offering back along the roadways or along wherever in the forest we were cutting. And then now when we do our walks back through the forest, that's busting turkey tails and, and all sorts of mushrooms on either end. And lizards are coming out of the middle and you know, we'll sometimes roll it back as like a, you know, just a little view into the earth. And um, you see all that. And I was talking earlier about uh, selling off part of our farm. And uh, we sold it to some amazing, amazing humus beings. And um, he was walking the road and he said, hey. Leave one. So when you stack the next ones on it, you can keep that cycle going and then harvest some for hugel beds or whatever you might do. But. I just love another what you were saying, Josh. Yeah, another really good idea is like if you live, if a person lives near forests, the unbelievable amount of of slash that they burn in the clear cuts is it's mind blowing. There's so much material left over, so much raw material left over by the loggers, and all they're gonna do is put it in the air. So really, like if you have a truck and a trailer, like an incredible amount of, of raw materials can be gathered out of clear cuts. And you should do it because you're not stealing future soil from the clear cut because all they're going to do is stack it up and burn it, which is just mind blowing. And then they try and replant a forest. With, it's, yeah, it's so frustrating. But yeah, so yeah, you, you know, but like you said, Craig, there's this balance, you know, like we're taking some, we're leaving some, but we, and we're, we're the mindset of, I think we need to rewild environments. I think we need to rewild our cannabis garden. I think we need to rewild our genealogy I think to have viruses because without viruses, our, our immune system cannot evolve. By stopping ourselves from getting sick, we're stopping our body, another muscle, the immune system, from working properly. Josh, it, we, it, be, learn it. Be, before learn it. we do any of this, to be honest, we need to lower the world population because the world cannot support the amount of people we have. If we had one-tenth of the amount of people we have, maybe the world could be okay. But in a sustainable way, we got too many, and it's only going to be more. Well, we live in a scarcity environment. So, yeah, based off the style of life that we live as 8 billion people on the planet, based off that style, based off what's been handed to us, we live in scarcity. It's not necessary. We can live in abundance if everyone participated in the concept that we're all trying to better ourselves and make more food. If everyone grew a little bit in their yard, on their roof, on their terrace, somewhere, something, it's possible for us to live in abundance even with 8 billion people on the earth. Yeah, we have, a, we have an abundance of scarcity and it is driving the market, literally. They make us feel a shortage and then it just drives and drives and drives. And without regenerative agriculture and regenerative 
soils, you can talk about soil science all day long. You can talk about terpenes, you can talk about sensory stuff, but 95% of the beers out there are coated in glyphosate. You know, most of the wine is cut so great. You've got all the sensory down, but the base of the sensory is, is tarnished. It's, it's toxic. So really like the first thing is how do we put health back into the system? How do we put health back in? Now we can talk about terpenes. Now we can talk about sensory and what the, but if we're analyzing sensory while we're getting poisoned by glyphosate, then it's, a, it's, it's just not a system that, that it's recognizable. It's, it's a broken system. So I, I constantly will continuously promote regenerative lifestyle and, and soils and regenerative style cultivation and polyculture and permaculture because I want to survive. I want to be one of those people that survive. Marcus, I have a question for you. Did you hear from Max Monroe's about the other type of terpenes he discovered? I mean, the other uh, trichomes, excuse me. No, I didn't. I only sent my message late last night, so I didn't hear back from him. But yeah, he did say that he was going to come back and share that with us as well as I think he there said was something he, else too. I forget. He he what? said he grafted hops and cannabis together. And oh, that's it. right. No, he didn't graft it. He bred it. Bred he it. crossed okay. it. Right, right, and right. I I was quite skeptical, but if somebody did it, I want to see it. Well, you're the doubting Thomas, and that's why you got to touch the incorporeal body of Christ. <laughs> well, uh, I'm very interested also if he thinks he has a different kind of a trichome. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested. Well, there have been quite a few posts, and even Ed Rosenthal picked on the, up on this recently. There is a guy who posts, and I don't know if they're just mutants, but he posted a picture of a trichome the other day that had like six little heads on top of it. I wish I could remember his name because he's posting all sorts of very, is, very is high level. In, is that in a variety? As a, a, I have no a idea. Percentage? I have no oh, idea. Okay. I just know or that just it's cannabis. Mutant. It could be a one of, it could be a mutant, it could be a variety. I just don't know enough about it, but um, it's definitely um, unique. And I wish, I wish I could kind of find one to share, but the only one person I know really is Ed that posted it. And he, whoever's running his account, po oh yeah, here we well, go. I, so this, this is it right here. Odd like it looks like opium poppy. <laughs> yeah, and funny Mark, enough, the six head. Hold it up and way? say something. Hold it up and say something so your screen is. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful. Okay, yeah, yeah. So um, six heads, although those heads, all six of them look smaller than the head that would normally be on a stalk of that size. Nice anthocyanin sort of coursing through the center there. I wish, um, let me let me shout this guy out. His name is Zoom underscore gardens. Um, go check him out on Instagram. He's uh, here, I'll punch it into the chat too. So it's Zooms underscore gardens. Doing some great work. Great, to see, uh, photographers great to see best friend in the house. Lots of love to you out in Maine. Hey, I gotta take off family and get some stuff done preparing for the rain that's coming this week and everything, so. Joshua, Craig, Wade, Sam, Johnny, Colin, Mark, Bubble Man. Many blessings to you. Lots of love. Thanks for coming keep in, brother. Growing, Josh. Keep, keep growing those seeds bigger and bigger, Josh. Looks beautiful. Sam, good job. Nice to see. Or right, wait, that's Joshua's plans. Yeah, sorry. I, I've been I I've been watering up. all all morning so i thought i'd just pop on and i always think i can hop on with a joint and a coffee and water and talk and that is just not possible <laughs> <laughs> i'm like what am i doing i'm trying to talk with people here so i finally finished my watering they look and if healthy. you guys follow my instagram at all you saw how I
this. But I lost the whole top 12, six to 12 inches and um, had a lot of work, big mistake. And I'm just so impressed with these plants. Um, big thanks to Josh and Kelly. I used uh, the lush roots and the Gaia green to kind of help push through some of this. But I'm just really impressed, man. Look at these tops. I'm gonna have a beautiful yield. Look at all these tops. I, I messed up my depth this morning. I was I just put this depth on a couple weeks ago and I was kind of working on timing it and I, I broke my shear pin. So I got to run to the hard, hardware store to get a new shear pin. So that's why I've got my depth on, on half of it. Look at this one. This is uh, one I, I, I selected out of 800 this summer. The black wop, wop gold. Look at these tops. I'm just my little fuck up's gonna give me a nice yield. I'm excited. That plant looks like straight up like a fucking canopy. Yeah, dude. Look, look at this big one back here. This uh, can you see that big girl? I'll walk over on one of these planks. Oh, I see this her back a, there in the shade. Yeah, in the shade. This big uh, black lime from Kevin Jodry. So I'm. This is six feet right here. She's seven, eight feet tall. We just started flower about three days ago. She's going to get way up there. Up you, the use, lights. you use light meters to figure out what kind of light your plants are getting there. Because Johnny B came over here the other day with this like utterly ridiculous multi thousand dollar light meter. Um, maybe he can tell us a little bit about that later. But do you, do you use anything like that, Josh? Just to know I don't, I, don't I can't on. afford one, but um, kind of the way. So in the greenhouses, we build the light system to be a supplement not to be a full on. These lights on, there's a ton of them. I'm only putting in about 20% of what the, the, the plants need, 20, 30%. Um, if I had the, like the depth on, I wouldn't be able to grow a good crop with just these lights. Are you in BC? I'm just below, I'm in, I'm on the border um, in Blaine, Birch Bay. Damn, maybe I can meet you. I could just pass the meter across. Yeah, oh, toss it over. I'll just leave arch. it sitting on the big, big football. The corner, you know, and you can pick it up and uh, leave it down in there and we'll meet the next day. Uh, this one's uh, caught the, the Congo, though, from up there, the Roberts Creek. Oh, shit. Congo yeah. Bongo. Seeing the shade, and I'm looking at, I, I, I've been doing this around my own yard by putting plants in solo cups at different parts of different spectrums underneath the different trees and looking at different reds and stuff. So I'm having a lot of fun with this right now. Um, just a heads what, up. What? In two minutes, okay. it's going to be 420 in Cape Verde. So I have a 420 clock right beside me. So I'm kind of like, but we'll just keep going here. Sorry. I was just uh, on the light kick. Um, so I'm putting on this depth and, and I built this greenhouse oriented east, east to west, right? Not north to south. Because, you know, my, my version of regenerative is that I grow year round and I only support people within 100 miles of me. And that that's kind of how I, I've, I've quantified this whole thing so i built this whole system to be a year-round greenhouse and to produce in the cold part of the year um and i had another another local flower guy come over and he's like what's up with that big tube if you can look up here i have a big i call it the, the light the dong of life uh but it's a big 36 inch tube that just distributes the air from the top of the greenhouse in, into the whole system and then I and, I, and I was just like, no, nah, man, I'm not, it's never been a problem. I've been running this dong for five years. And, and I start talking to him real confidently about uh, the understory and, and where plant cannabis is in succession and how it's kind of an understory plant and, and the diffusion. And I start talking about rattling all this stuff. And, and, you know, just to describe it better, I have a two layers of poly here. And when you blow them up, it creates a light diff diffusion and it reduces the brightness in the greenhouse, but it also spreads it out. And you can see it on the plant canopy. If you go, you know, if I walk from one greenhouse with the double layer poly into another one with a single layer poly, you can totally, or, and then, then outside, you can totally see the sharp light. You can see how it affects the foliage. Um, and I've also kind of fucked around with putting some plants in the edge of my forest and, and kind of watched in stages and watched the ones that maybe were a little bit farther back, how they did. And I'm fully convinced that the, the plants do like a little bit less light, a little, little bit more diffused light. Um, but then I got this, this uh, depth on here and it's creates some serious shadows. And so now I'm like, oh man, what have I done? Um, I kind of just say a lot just to bring up the topic about, about lighting and, 
in diffusion. And since you were talking about it, you know, I don't know what, what anybody else has dug in there and, and, you know, working in the diffused and less bright world, you know, and indoors is, it's a much different idea. You're kind of just trying to hit a specific target, you know, and maintain that for an amount of time. Or I, I just had some, uh, I had some results with some indoor back of the room changes with a strain, my gas mask, <clears throat> excuse me, actually seemed to have done better, kind of even mossier, stinkier, even a little bigger on the flowers in the back end of the room. I like the light depths, even being able to drop the tarp. If you got a hot time during planting, you can drop down halfway and kind of use it for your own like shade, transitional shading at the peak heat of the day. And it's because it's been kind of hot in Maine, even the last week, over 80. So, yeah. I have a question I'll, I'll ask um, the, uh, you, the farmers here. Uh, do you guys think or suspect that there's um, anything to do with uh, climate change that has impacted the atmosphere, which has caused lighting to be different for us growing cannabis now in this time period versus what the cannabis plant might have been typically um, used to uh, working with <clears throat> on, on Earth prior to humanity doing what we've done up until this point i will quick thing first thing came, came, came on my head was the fires you know two weeks in august with with uh, no sun when i'm when you're making flowers through you know into september that's a big deal um that's a real crucial transition time and, and the west coast folks feel that pretty hard um the other thing i was i was thinking on the back end was the almost a positive effect if you look at it from a, a greedy humanistic perspective that, that we're able to, to cultivate in places where we weren't able to cultivate before. Um, it, it's a really big, interesting question on my mind. I, I've, I've had a hard go of it here on my farm in large part with my neighbors and neighbor conflicts that have made it really miserable. For many a times I've been well, wanting to give up and, and, and dreamt about moving away to another place and, and, and thought, where would I do it? And then I start kind of looking into what the future looks like in different places. And I'm like, God damn, I'm in a, one of the best spots to really be going forward. Um, I don't know, just kind of the, the thoughts that I have when I'm thinking about how these things, things are gonna be in the future and water is a big fear for me, even though I, I'm in an abundant water place, um, I, I think that, that the whole thing's gonna be a real, real big issue coming going forward with the way companies get it, are getting into charging and et cetera. Sorry, I cut someone else off. I'll let whoever else was going to pop in go. All good. I was just kind of agreeing with you. I'm definitely seeing some changes and I'm seeing hotter sun back into Maine here than I thought I would see coming from the West Coast. And I got a big open up property here. So I'm full spread of sunrise to sunset mostly here, you know, but, uh, see the bigger yields and the, and the earth seems drier this year here, really dry compared. It's not fire dry like the West coast, but it's kicking up dust. My ponds are dropping like a foot and a half already. And it's been a hot May. Uh, one of the big things I've seen that's kind of like driving the dogs nuts, driving us nuts are the bugs have kicked up the black flies, early mosquitoes. Uh, luckily the dragonflies came in about a month earlier because and, I, you know, the, the change in climate, and I don't know if that's just a two-year blip that we're seeing, but here as an outdoor farmer in Maine, it's definitely hotter, drier kind of drought conditions coming in, and I'm seeing a kick up of bugs that seem to bring in the insect environment pretty hard. Uh, you know, they haven't been plaguing us, but there's definitely waves of of bugs. We've gotten a bunch of the corn borers in the last few years that seem to have come in and you know, anyway, that's what I'm seeing some stuff here. Yeah, I would lean in and uh, offer this thought uh, to your question, Max. Uh, I don't think the cannabis plant itself is going to have any trouble with what we're doing to the environment uh, because it's dealt with all kinds of crazy shit. In the 
question is what's going to be the effect on humans and the cannabis industry, if you will, the opportunity for folks to work with this plant, create product and uh, live a life that we all enjoy. Uh, and I think that's a really different question. Um, and I think that Josh and Kelly with the Dragonfly Earth Medicine concepts around regenerative practices certainly point to one of many different things that we as humans are gonna to have to do in order to preserve something like the life we currently enjoy uh, going forward over the next few generations of humans. I have grandchildren and I think this is the real issue of our time. I, I've been a, a fervent cannabis advocate for many years, I still am, but I really think what we're doing to the environment that we live in, that we all share as humans, is the real question of our time. And uh, so circling all the way back to your question, Max, yeah, I think it's gonna be a real issue going forward, not just for cannabis, but for growing food. For growing food is gonna be an issue for us going forward. And that's my thoughts. I, I think the cannabis plan will be fine. Thank you. I'm con concerned about the air quality too. Um, you know, for, for, for growing, just to tag onto that, that food thought, you know, that, that the quality of the air that we're, we're going to produce, we're going to have to, you know, grow, to grow healthy food, we're going to have to possibly grow in greenhouses, filter the air and have cleaned air, you know, places to grow our healthy food and our medicines is a, is a fear that I have. Yeah, and I, I'll just throw one last thing in. I know that some of the farmers that are in this group here, as well as listening on the, to the uh, Hash Church uh, broadcast, uh, may have come to recognize that it's actually more of a challenge to grow food than it is to grow cannabis, especially if you're trying to grow at scale. Um, that's been my experience at least. Uh, just talk about germinating seeds of food crops uh, as compared to germinating cannabis seeds. And I'll leave it there, thank you. Same with producing seeds. Uh, celery and other seeds take two years to produce a crop of. So it's, you know, it's more work for sure. Yeah, one By the way, I, here's one, another one I got from Russia. It's master breeder. Congratulations, Sam, you are known all over the world. Master breeder. That's what everyone calls themselves at LPs now. They've turned that into a bad, a bad word. Well, master growers. Sometimes I think it should be master baiters, but uh, that's really cool. Um, I guess here's another good question uh, on the lighting perspective um, for a room of intelligent growers is um, I've heard some people say before that uh, there are varieties that have spent so much time growing indoors that they are indoor varieties, meaning transferring them outdoors, they either don't do as well or can't handle the intensity of the outdoor environment um, because they've more or less evolved uh, you know, over a 10 year period to be in the, in the environment of, a, of an indoor space. Do you guys think there's any amount of truth to that? Um, do you think that there are some plants that after spending too much time indoors um, ha has a change uh, in, in the plant's life and cycle that's noticeable when you were to, to put it outside? So um, not, yeah. not from a single year of selection. But if you grew a big crop and selected the most leaning towards indoor performance, and you did that for 10 generations in a row, then you would have made one small step in that direction. I kind of see it, Craig. How's that? There we go. Um, yeah. I, I resonate with what um, Sam was saying, and I've witnessed it um, when I've been giving been given some indoor seeds specifically from from that uh, side of things, and the 
more airy or more bushy than my liking. And pl the plant, cannabis plant specifically, I feel is a really quick learner. One, one season of uh, breeding, the next year, boom, the, the structure has changed. It can support itself. And then, you know, what Sam was saying, we do that a couple years in a row and the phenotypic knowledge starts being passed down and um, it, 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 it learns so quickly. And, and that's a really good uh, thing to talk about. I, I witnessed it probably five years ago. Um, I forget what the cultivar was, but you know, folks that would even tour my garden would, would go, what is that? It smells amazing, but it didn't have the structure to stand where, where it uh, was in the garden. It needed to be inside. And um, it's good. it took one season to learn, unlearn that or to learn the new process. And this Max, winter, excuse go me. ahead. Max, what is the new type of trichome and the, uh, you, do you have photos of the, of the hop hybrid with uh, cannabis? <laughs> I, I do. Um, I do have photos of that stuff. Um, I didn't prepare them because I didn't know <laughs> that that's what we were doing. So um, I guess I could uh, see if I could quickly open a few files. I also don't know how much I, uh, I should share before my new book comes out. Um, what about the new trichome? Can you give it its name? Yeah, I can. Well, I can tell you what I want to name it. Um, and uh, apparently I, I have the opportunity to name it. Um, the uh, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to name it after myself. Um, what I thought would be appropriate from a naming perspective, though, was something in alignment um, that uh, Meshulam uh, where he came up with anandamide, um, the Sanskrit word for bliss, um, which also has some Hebrew translations and iterations and has some biblical essence and in, in nature um, in some senses. Um, uh, I am Jewish and I also study uh, the esoteric world. I love uh, Kabbalah, Torah, all that kind of stuff. And so, um, with that thought process, I asked, what would the seventh be or mean in a Hebrew word or essence um, and in a, in a meaningful way? Because this would be the seventh type of trichome found. Um, we have two types of non-glandular trichomes, unicellular and cystolithic. We have uh, bulbous simple and bulbous complex. You have sessile and you have capitate stocked. Um, and so that's six. And so this would be the seven. And uh, so this, from a name perspective in Hebrew, there's uh, the name in Hebrew that means seven and seven from a miracle perspective is Nessia. And this trichome is also capitate stocked. It has a very long stalk and it has a, a, a head but instead of a mushroom shaped head, it's an upside down teardrop shaped head. In all of those trichomes, they're a teardrop shaped head. So it's, it's got a really interesting uh, roundness to it with kind of like a, a point and a dew drop that comes off of it. And then the stock itself is a third of the width of a capitate stocked trichome. Um, so there are these really thin, long stalks with these dewdrop shaped heads off the end of them. Um, and so I would name it Capitate Stocks Nessia, um, the seventh, the seventh trichome. And to me, it's a miracle that no one else has scientifically, you know, put the put a white paper on this yet. And, and uh, Max, did you yeah. find it in all varieties of cannabis or just particular lean towards a particular uh, wide leaf, skinny leaf, equatorial, northern. So um, I'm not sure of the, the origin of the geography of the plants at all. Um, 
we, I can confirm that I've found them in both hemp types and marijuana types. Um, and um, the, I, I can show you a picture. If you want, I'll, I'll find a picture of one. I'll show it to you right now since I'm talking about it. The, the, the thing is, is they are very, 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 very rare. You just rarely see them. Um, and so if you have Instagram and follow these incredible um, artists that do incredible trichome photography, you see hundreds, if not thousands of microscopic shots of, of trichomes um, on a weekly or monthly basis. And at least I do. And when you look at these trichomes, and very, very up close. These images are just incredible. Um, I'm always hunting for these special trichomes that pop up rarely. And um, when I do find one, uh, and then I have an opportunity to acquire the flower, and I'm able to really look at it myself, you do find those other trichomes within it. And it's extremely exciting. Um, and then, uh, uh, apart from that, um, I have found multiple new types of trichomes, uh, some of which are trichomes that are non-glandular, that are four to five times longer than most of the other trichomes. So these very long curly Q trichomes that are, they're just kind of outrageous. Um, and then I've also found trichomes where the glandular head is in the center of the stalk. So instead of the head being on the end of the stalk, there's a stalk, then there's a glandular. Crazy trichomes Max is finding are actually novel trichomes. Like who's the judge over here when it comes to this kind of stuff? Um, and that would be a good question to ask. Um, if you know the work of Paul Mulberg, he's a scientist that has done cannabis, cannabinoid, and trichome research for the United States federal government for over 30 years. And um, his younger lab techs and lab assistants, one of which is Um, and so bringing them in a live uh, um, plant with these trichomes will give them the opportunity to dissect the trichomes microscopically for their anatomy. And so you have to actually pull the anatomy out of the trichomes and lay them, these microscopic uh, glands out, um, almost like you're doing a, um, it's not a biop. Uh, when you uh, take apart a dead body, you um, what are you doing? Thank you, Mark. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. They love how, like, whenever I'm like this close to like looking like I know what I'm talking about, Mark always steps in. He's like, "Let, let me help you out here." <laughs> well, yeah, Ma Max, we've we've talked about Paul Malberg before. I think uh, actually, um, uh, Sam, don't you know Dr. Kim? Or I, I, think I I know I've met Dr. Kim. I right. know Dr. Malberg. I financed their lab for five years of work with cannabis with Carl yeah. Hilling. There you go. So your comments are just right on though and centered on, you know, the wonderful research that he did and the legacy that like through Dr. Kim. And I, I'm sorry for cutting you off.
Yes. Well, we stand on the shoulders of giants, including Sam. So, you know, where we are today and what we can do with the plant and cannabinoid science in general are really due to a handful of individuals that walk the face of the earth. One of them who graces our panel today, but others like Paul Malberg and Raphael Mishulam and Roger Adams and, um, and those but guys. Canada, who, Ernie Small. Yeah, I, I always think of those those Brits who first made distillate back in the 1890s and called it, A called Adam. it, C yeah, no, this was way before Adams, These, this was, um, Easterwood, East, Easterfield, Spivy and Wood, yeah, Wood, right. Spivy and Easterfield, the first people to isolate THC, so, um, yeah, man, I mean, we stand on the shoulders of all these people, Max, and it's just like when you read and, and through open access, you could read most of Malberg's research. In fact, there's a website that actually has a list of all Paul Malberg's papers, and there's like 30 of them. I mean, it's it's amazing. Go ahead. Um, thank you. And uh, I was just going to ask Bubble Man, if you can grace me with the ability to share my screen, I can show some of these trichomes I'm talking about. Wow, that's amazing. It, it is showing your screen. That's not my screen. Wh whose photos are those? <laughs> that's, that's Zoom Gardens, and I'll share them afterwards. He has the most incredible, insane mutant macro photographs of cannabis. So while Max was talking about this, I was going, I mean, that last one I just showed was like a trichome that literally had stalks all inside the stalk, but they're also trichomes growing off the stalk. So I just figured it suited the conversation, but I will figure out going in right now and gracing you with the ability to share the screen. I don't know why it sets it up so only of the host can share, but you, you should be good to go now, Max. All right. So um, this is in my book, Interpening. Um, and if you look on the upper right-hand screen, um, this was the first time I actually ever saw the seventh trichome type um, was when I was sifting through trichome photography from my buddy, uh, Schwale. He used to live in Denver, um, and I was actually at his house uh, just going through his pictures because I was going to purchase some for my company, for our website, and uh, for stuff like my book. And um, it wasn't until after I actually uh, bought this photograph from him and I brought it home and I was looking at it again and I saw the, it was really the stock that stood out to me more than anything else. Um, and you can't see the, it's little unicorn horn that kind of pulls off the end as well on this photo. But um, this was the first image that I ever had of these. And I have uh, many more images of them um, and you know, uh, we used to, we were the contract for Dope Magazine when we judged all of their uh, cannabis competitions. And I mean, my team of seven sifting through hundreds of types of cannabis microscopically at competitions for years on end in multiple different states, uh, we found one of these uh, while we were judging. And it was cool to have a, a team of us guys who know this stuff real well, all be able to look through a microscope and turn a flower around and continue to see this, this one rare trichome that very rarely sticks its head out um, show up. And, and we could all definitely see it with our own eyes, verify that it was there, take pictures of it. Um, do, but you think that's it. do you think this is genetically or environmentally controlled? Do you have any idea of why it has a different shape? Is the waxy cuticle emitted different? Or you, you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, and this that's this that's the you're, you, that's the area that I need a lot of help with, right? Because I'm not a, um, a scientist at this level. Well, it and, it would be interesting, Max, if you could find. A, a particular clone or variety where most of the trichomes were this bulbous type, or I forget the name you gave it, I, 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 but I'll just call it, you know, 
not round, not oval, but uh, tear shaped upside down. Yeah, um, I think, you know, this, you know, I, to me, science is a community. That, that would show it was genetically controlled. I, you know, si science to me is a community effort. And my, my role in this has been to be the one to observe it and spend five years trying to find it and getting my hands on the genetic that consistently produces this trichome um, and, and, and then growing it out, bringing that to a scientist, uh, a team of scientists at a university, and then letting them officially officiate the fact that this is a new novel trichome. And then from there, when I have a genetic and I've got the clones, I've got the mothers and I've got a white paper and this is something novel and important, um, I would definitely be willing to give this plant to someone who would be able to do the type of research that you were just mentioning, yeah. Sam. Well, the, uh, the head shape is important, but it's the stem that is really, really unique, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. Well, well and, it. It, and the cannabinoid content. I mean, let's face right. it, if these things are being grown for, for cannabinoid content, what is the impact? On, on, on cannabinoid profile and yield from these. I mean, when I see the more bulbous trichome, I always think conventionally like, you know, and from reading Malberg's work where they actually micro catheterize these things to actually suck the juice out of these trichomes. I mean, that the more bulbous the trichome, the more oil that's there, the higher the yield would be the more mature the cannabis profile would be in the oil also, Mark, from that gland. Does it have a different number of cells inside the resin head that are emitting the cannabinoids and terpenes? That would be, I, I'm quite curious. Right, like the terpene, so are, are, are we referring to the, to the like the lower left-hand side, uh, the one where it just looks like it has a head that shriveled, shriveled up? Oh. No, no, because no, the upper right hand side. Yeah, the upper right hand, the top side. Unfortunately, the in this photograph, the trichome that's centered is the, the middle trichome, which is a beautiful image of a right. what I would consider a, a perfect capitate stock trichome. If if we were judging trichomes for their right. Uh, but if you go to the, the farthest trichome of the very right, the stock of the teardrop. I see now my, my Zoom speaker panel was covering that, Max. I can see oh, it now. Oh, well, welcome to the party, Mark. Check it. <laughs> yeah. No, I can yeah. see it. So it comes it comes to a point at the very end. Okay, I see. I see. And, it. and the stem is a, a, a quarter the thickness of the big fat stems of the other trichomes. Yeah, so really wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't you worry that that would make these trichomes brittle? And yes. <laughs> Okay. They are. Yeah. So that'd be a real drag if you're trying to make cash and the trichome stems were brittle and it, the resin fell off really easy when you wanted it to. Real bummer. Well, you, you know what I was hearing, and I've heard this now twice in like as many weeks, Sam, is that these high CBG varieties, especially the white, there's a variety called the white that's a very high variety in CBG. It's... it's um, grown here in North America, and it's like anywhere between 13 to 18% CBG, hardly any THC at all. And they said that's what they said. The issue with that is that, you know, harvesting and getting the material to the lab is, is very, very crucial because the trichomes are so brittle, you get a lot of loss in just handling the plant material. Hey, Mark, this is some CBG right here that I'm holding up, if you can see that. That's uh, some some sift nice. that made. Um, yeah, well, I'd have to agree. What percentage CBG What's is What's it analyzed for? So it's uh, on the, the flower was, uh, I think, uh, 12 to 15%, depending on the batch. And then the hash came in around, um, or the, the sift, I should say, come, came around in, you know, anywhere from 60 to 70. Really? 70% yeah. CBG? Yeah. Yep. I'm surprised it was green. CBGA. It green, didn't it? There CBGA. he is. I was waiting, Mark. <laughs> CBGA. So yeah, Sam, this is uh, this now. is just shift. 
Um, it's quite nice, actually. I like the effects from CBG. It's really interesting, very uplifting. And the turf profile and those isolates are pretty, I mean, it's, it's nice. It's like a good product, right? It's okay. I mean, it just depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for a more hempy uh, profile, then it's right up your alley. If you're looking for a drug cultivar, really terpy, you know, it's not really that. Um, but I, I don't know the, the background on the white, to be honest. Um, it came in from Switzerland. Those guys brought those, those genetics in from Switzerland. I saw it happen <laughs> like two go. years over a period of like two years, Sam. They had this, this variety over in Europe last year. Then the next no, thing I, I know, I, those, I know guys, exactly. those guys all formed LLCs in Oregon. Yeah. And the next but, year, but I guess my Oregon. question is, where did the Swiss get it from? From the Italians and the Italians, I know where they got it from, from the Ukrainians. You know what, yeah, I, wanna, they, I wanna add something in real quick. The picture he has up there now, I have seen, I have pictures of these for sure, Max, that I can uh, go through and send you. I always thought it was a systolith hair that a tri, cause I'd seen trichomes break off and land on other components that weren't necessarily growing there. They so were, have I, Marcus. What's that? So have I seen what you've seen, but heads can fly around and be stuck on things that didn't produce them. Yeah, I always thought of this as like, but then again, it is such a like it's too hot long of a, of a hair. It's too straight. It's just too different. But I, I have photos like this for sure. From like 2008 to 2012. another head or it's sticking to a stock so therefore the head is sticking on the side of the stock like totally i'm 100 like you, you know you're talking to someone who's who geeks out on trichomes oh, I started the trichome max that's why peer-reviewed science is beautiful when exactly you, that's why when I'm you <laughs> when you allow others to examine it and try to poke holes in it yeah. then if it stands you've got it Exactly. And I want people to, to, to look into this. I want university scientists to say, I want them to be the ones to say this is scientifically real and novel because um, I'm the passionate, uh, you know, cannabis enthusiast, interpreter, expert. Um, I'm, I'm just the one who says, I think this is novel. And I'll bring this to you. And so that, that's what I've, but it's also taken me five years to find the variety and confirm that it is what it is and then get seed from it. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's been, you could write a novel on uh, how crazy this has been. Um, these trichomes here, you know, there's, it's, it's also really interesting how mushroom-like trichomes appear. Um, and, and what's really interesting is um, the fruiting body of LSD is also extremely phallic and mushroom-like. I don't know if you guys have ever seen um, the fruiting body of ergot fungus uh, that produces... Aspergillus clovatus. Yeah, I have a, that tattooed to my kneecap. Um, but it looks just so mushroomy and so yeah you see this cluster of mushroom looking trichomes here um and it appears like that almost maybe that brittle factor where you said the trichome heads might have fallen off those two trichomes right here it's either this has a very tiny head with a point coming out of it um and the one behind it looks like its head fell off um but these are the trichomes that have a stem that is a third the width of a typical capitate stocked trichome uh, width. You can see the capitate stock trichome uh, down to the lower right, right there. And um, yeah, this is that bizarre uh, bulbous shaped head, which is not your classic capitate stock shaped head. And then the rest of the trichome continuing off 
from that head, that is not a mutation, I don't think. And I also don't think that's, you know, a trichome that broke off and fell somewhere else. I really do believe that between uh, this image and the other images that you have, we're seeing varieties of, of this type of trichome. Um, well, that's, that, that was my first question, Max. Um, you know, I'm not an expert on plant trichomes. I do know a couple, though. Um, but factor or some other anomaly that's producing that. Well, um, the, what I, there's one variety that when I found it, it had this trichome on it, we said, okay, it's this variety. And I secured some of that variety that was grown in um, the East Coast. I secured some that was grown in the Midwest. I secured some that was grown up north and I'm growing it right now in Colorado. And so different environments in different geographies are seemingly to produce the same trichome based off of the genetic that it is. And so I don't think it's an environmental stress factor that's causing these trichomes to abruptly change their shape. I think this is a type of cannabis plant that is growing a new type of trichome that is a needle in a haystack. I think that's what it is. And that's why I've been dedicated to securing the genetic, growing it out, making a relationship with university scientists to confirm that, right? So I'm not- Just to be clear, the cannabis that you're finding these uh, different trichomes, it's not exclusively those that you're finding those intermingled with regular looking trichomes, the trichomes that we've always seen. Yes. So, so these are just sort of like a, a minor, you know, type of trichome that you're finding yeah. the more you're looking at these uh, uh, close-up images of trichomes. Yeah. Do we know if they've been there all along, Sam? And maybe, you know, Max's discovery here is just... Any, anything is possible. But what I'd like to say is that if you can find a variety where the majority of the trichomes are of this phenotype or genotype, whatever they are, then uh, it's probably genetically controlled. If you can find one out of a thousand or one out of a million, and you can only find it on some plants and not other plants, then uh, yeah, uh, maybe the environment should be looked at. I, I really don't know if, it's, if it could be environmental or, or but uh, if, if it's real, we want to know and we want to track down and if it's genetically controlled, you can create a variety that all of the resin heads are like that or 99% of them. That's what I was gonna say. Have you, can you, have you tried to breed with any of it and, and make those observations? I mean, I know it's, it's early and it would take a ton of- What you need to do is self it to find yeah. individuals that have more, uh, a higher incidence. Here's some uh, jar rot trichomes for you. <laughs> I think this was the white. I was I was looking for when you uh, one of you. Yeah, this is the white. I'm pretty sure um, because the white produces just the the most bizarre trichomes that there are. They are capitate stalked trichomes. But are, they these, are, the, are these the high CBG varieties, Max? Yes, yes, yes. They are and. You know, they call the plant the white. Here it is. This is the white. They call it the white. It's a different kind of white than uh, ripe trichomes when they emanate 
um, fullness, when, they're, when their glandular heads are full of chemistry and they're at a ripening point prior to degradation, it's different because that type of white is almost this creamy white, this mother of pearl white, um, and what this high CBG variety produces is trichomes that are glowing bright white, okay? So let's just say that there's like, you know, in the paint store, there's a difference between like eggshell white and bright white that is almost like offensive. It's blinding, you know, there's, there's a difference in brightness. This, this high CBG grows these trichomes that are glowing bright white and all of the glandular heads are white and the stalks of the heads are white too. And that's what makes this variety striking. It really, it's striking. Um, and so how does that work? Why is that happening? How come the, the why is the white producing trichomes that are just this, this unique? <clears throat> Well, you stop the cannabinoid biosynthetic pathway at, at not its endpoint, at at its penultimate endpoint, right? But um, I I I don't know if the physiological character. And not making THCA or CB, CBDA or. Or, or the other miners. Have you seen the rub chemical the profile on these? If you rub these white resin well, from a fresh plant, like that looks like that, and uh, is it just as sticky as a, a normal THC high plant? I, from a, from an aroma perspective. No, no. Rub your fingers on the resin. Is it as sticky and oily as a THC variety? Yeah. So, unfortunately, I have not had the pleasure to uh, grow this plant out myself. Yeah, uh, I, I can answer the question. Yes, Sam. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just trying to get to a reason that makes logical sense. Why I mean, is why? I, I I took one of the, I took a, a couple tops off of a. Uh, uh, plants that a farmer, an Amish farmer had down in Maryland down the road, took it back to my lab, did an alcohol extraction and got like a 90 pure CBG. He had about one or 2%. THC. So there's a lot of timing uh, that needs to go into harvesting if you're harvesting for CBG. And Mark, maybe you can talk about this as well, but this variety, the, the people you can go to the grocery store and buy a watermelon that is just natural and it comes packed full of seed and then you can buy a genetically modified watermelon that is just seedless or grapes that are seedless or apples that are seedless this variety i think if you go online and possibly buy oregon seed um, they the one that, um, you can buy this plant and grow a field of it but if you wanted to grow a field of it again, um, I guess if you, I, I'm sure you can clone it, <laughs> but um, I just found it really interesting that this stuff in a variety of different ways. And every time I've come in contact with it, uh, just to answer Sam's question uh, from my perspective is the plant was, extraordinarily dehydrated. It had no aroma profile whatsoever. It had no stickiness whatsoever. It was a very dry texture and smell aroma experience. And it almost was disappointing. Like it didn't have a lot to offer other than the fact that it looked nutty with its crazy white trichomes and 
it's pretty crazy to find a plant with this much biomass with that amount of cannabigerol that late in the flowering cycle. Uh, because I'm, I'm pretty sure we all know that CBG is the mother cannabinoid that starts building the others and that that process happens really early on in flower. And that's why you don't typically find a lot of CBG when you harvest your plant at the end of the cycle. The fact that this plant is being harvested at the end of its cycle and it, the damn thing is packed full of CBG, it's crazy. But uh, from us like marijuana lovers, um, it's not a ooey gooey, sticky, funky, skunky herb. It's just not, uh, at least what I came in contact with. And then I was sifting through pounds of this stuff, looking for a seed desperately. And you just, not even the remnants of a seed, not even a, uh, a, a hollow bract casing that would ho hold a seed, no seed whatsoever. This is a seedless variety. <clears throat> uh, from the producers who produce it. Of course, I'm sure you can find this variety that does produce seed. I'm just saying in the marketplace, currently in the largest amount, this is a seedless variety. Hey, hey Max, um, could you show us the Pinkleberry photo? <laughs> yeah, you know who I, uh, who I got these from? Jesse. No, or, oh, no, no, certified dank. Yep. Yeah, I think I'm going to use one of these in my new book if I can squeeze it in. I think this is the one, and I just posted this on the Tricome Institute uh, Instagram page. But I'm, I'm just always in awe when you see style stigma that is just that striking. It's just, I mean, talk about weed porn. That is just unreal. Yeah, it's beautiful. We're, we're actually growing the Pinkleberry by coffee, Kai's coffee, uh, this year. It's a, it's a collaboration those guys did. So we're super excited to have it here in Southern Humboldt and see how it looks and does. Right on. I've, I've seen Afghan plants that would produce the, those colors of hairs uh, for d -Wiz, the first ones I saw was in the 70s. Yeah, I'll never forget the first time I photographed pink hairs under the macro and it just, I mean, even just one or two of them were so striking and so incredible that uh, I remember giggling you know, as I shot that plant. Yeah, our, uh, Coyote Blue um, does that as well. And every once in a while you can uh, dry it, cure it, and revisit it, and you can still see some of that color. That doesn't always happen. It's it's a very special, special thing when you when you go revisit it and you you see the color variations. It's beautiful. Hey Craig, does the coffee that you're working with um, does it have a, a a distinct and noticeable coffee aroma to it, or is it just called coffee? Danny, I was actually just texting with uh, Kaya himself just now. Um, yeah, so it's it's an Af yeah, out of Afghani stock that he made, and it and and uh, it definitely has a. I've only had it a couple times, so yeah, I'm going off memory, but it's almost reminiscent of, of Gorilla Glue, but but different, you know, where Gorilla Glue to me is more chocolate. I, I was at Justin Calvino's place in Mendocino and um, he was showing me this coffee and I was just doing backflips. I was over the moon excited because coffee is my second favorite drug and I love coffee and cannabis together. I have mugs that have coffee and cannabis together. I mean, they just, it's just, they just love it. But the, and, and cannabis is just, I mean, what other thing in the world smells like blueberry or cat piss, smells like skunk or like lemonade punch, 
smells like tangerines or dog shit. Smells exactly like coffee. I mean, this plant can mimic the identical aroma profiles of beverages, food, and uh, fecal matter uh, like like a pro. And you, you, you just think that like coffee would be like, oh, this guy is stoned and just imagines this, this smells like coffee. It's like, no, smell it. This smells like coffee. This cannabis plant smells like coffee. And I got so excited and Calvino was like, yeah, I just rescued this one little clone and it like looked like sad and sickly on the side. And he's like, there's no more of this anywhere left. He's like, this is the last of the coffee. And I was terrified <laughs> that we were going to lose this like amazing plant. And I've always wanted to do a pairing um, at a, uh, with a coffee cuppers. I don't know if you guys know that like a wine, sommelier, sommelier, uh, cannabis and terpener and terpening. Um, you know, you're a beer cicerone, you're a cheese monger, uh, you're a um, and if you guys haven't seen the the experts, some of which is actually shown in California, where these crazy Californians are growing coffee um, as a vine horizontally instead of letting the tree grow up vertically. I think you can find that on uh, Vice. I think it's called something like Coffee Land to Mecca, Coffee Land Mecca. But if you look that up, you will see these people that are just so enthralled with, um, uh, with coffee. But I, I'm sorry for that rant. I just got excited that you have this variety, Craig. So um, I would love to um, I would love to do a, a do something with that a coffee pairing they, with, with coffee. They, they oh, also here, they also do it with tea, with uh, cigars. I mean, teas. It's just on and on and on. And only in Japan are you considered a tea master. Well, I think China produces more tea and uh, some really fancy ones. From a product perspective, I'm sure China does, but from a uh, hospitality perspective, I don't think anybody serves tea the way that a Japanese formal tea party is is done. It's 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 a pretty elaborate ceremony, if you will. Indeed, it is. I've got to I've got to uh, say good day to everybody. Um, Temperature's getting hot and we've got lots and lots of nursery stock out there that needs to be up potted and implanted and cared for. So I want to thank everyone um, today for this time and space. I appreciate y'all. Good to see you, buddy. Thanks for Great coming in, Craig. Thank you. Good luck on the farm. Later, Craig. Never get the farmers for more than a couple hours if you're Take lucky. care, Joshua. You got to work on plants. I'm gonna say I, I have some mycology pr uh, projects today I need to get to and um, a couple hundred cacti I need to move. Um, uh, Max, are you showing the, the uh, hops cannabis or are you saving that till next week yeah thanks for getting on to that. what a what a thanks uh, for getting on to that i want to hear about that man i'm i my top three are hops or are beer coffee and cannabis so when you're talking about coffee i light up and then I, I totally spaced on that but i okay you guys you pull all my, uh, all these secrets out of me. Cause I'm trying to like, you know, do the science on these trichomes before other people do. I'm trying, I, I would never, you know, go on something as big as hash church with as many. You, you've got some of the world's experts in Korea. <laughs> Let me tell you. Yeah. Well, and you know what? And that's why I appreciate when you guys, uh, confirm that what I think I've discovered, um, might actually be, uh, something worth worth sharing. Uh, these are all cannabis and hops uh, hybrids.
And so this, this is a vine that is producing hop cones and the hot, right? And the hop cone will grow downward, kind of like, like a little, uh, right? It's a little hop, it's a hop cone. These hop cones are covered in glandular trichomes that are producing 17% THC, 8% CBD. And so you can grow a wall of these hops up the side of your house uh, in vine-like ways and, and pull the mature cones off of the plants. Um, Is that based on dried weight of plant material, those yeah. percentages? Yes. So can you repeat that again, Max? Yeah, so you're looking right now, you're actually looking at microscopic trichome pictures of this hybrid of humulus and cannabis. And you can, these are the glandular trichomes that are producing anywhere between, um, uh, I think 12 to 17% THC and upwards of five to 8% CBD. And the, the cones are um, smokable. This is a great image of the plant. Uh, you can definitely tell that this is not anything like uh, duck foot or any of the other webbed foot varieties because of the rest of the shape of the leaf. Notice how there's no uh, ridges in the leaf, right? Like if this was duck foot, you would see leaf ridging and look at the trichome matter <laughs> coming out of this hot plant. Um, I mean, that is really uh, uh, quite, uh, quite cannabis indicative. Um, this is, uh, the plant, this is a cannabis hot plant. And this one is growing, this one took on more of the form of the cannabis plant and less hop vine. So this is really like a bushy kind of cannabis plant, um, but it is not 100% cannabis. This one is another great example, but this one does have the leaf uh, ridging. And the reason why is because um, uh, this is not the same genetic as the last one. Um, what, uh, what I can tell you about this genetic is this was actually ruderalis that was crossbred with um, the type of hop plant that receives uh, the cannabis genetics as a cross. Max, is he producing corn, corms, like from what a, a, a hop root is or is it producing seeds? It is producing seeds. Uh, the hop plant and cannabis both produce seed. What's the terpene profile like? It hasn't been tested yet. Does it also have rhizomes? Can we produce that way? Yeah, that, that's what I was referring to by corms. Right. Oh, I, right. I don't know yeah. the proper term. I... Um, I am not growing this plant, and the gentleman who created the, the, the first variety that actually took and turned into an F7 uh, humulus cannabis is in Europe. Um, this is a, a friend of mine who got a hold of the genetic in the United States and crossed it with um, some marijuana types that he, he was hybridizing um, indoors in his basement. And so this is a cannabis leaf that took on the shape of that hop plant I was showing you that has the uh, duck foot, but without the leaf ridging. And so here you have a cannabis leaf that actually took on the smooth leaf edge instead of the ridged edging. Um, and, and that's carried down from that hop line and that hop genetic. And so these genetics are they're brand spanking new in, in the world of species. Um, this is a new species. I mean, th that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a new species. And, and then what's interesting is a little of this species genetic profile can go back into cannabis and put some of its genome back into more uh, uh, you know, cannabis genetics. And I think that's what you're seeing here with other cannabis farmers breeding into the genetic or breeding the genetic into cannabis. And really this just produces a thousand more questions than it does answers, right? 
what is this? What's the terpene profile? What's the trichomes look like? I, I think these are passionate farmers and breeders doing what they do best, which is just growing this stuff out and seeing what they get. But these guys aren't putting this stuff under microscopes, um, nor are they bringing this stuff to universities to study um, uh, the genome profile with uh, in that way. And so I, I hope to just assist these passionate breeders um, and uh, by, by helping them bring some of the genetics to universities and other places to produce some white papers on this stuff because without question, this is new stuff. This is brand new stuff um, in cannabis for sure. It's no longer cannabis. It's no longer cannabis, exactly. Yeah, now we're, we're getting into new territory. <laughs> well, very trippy, dude. Thanks for sharing. That was... Uh, that yeah, was totally. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, it's an honor, right? Like, this is... How well, cool it'd be interesting to, like, dab those concentrates. Like, what would it concentrate <laughs> from those, right? I mean... I, I i go right to that right <laughs> it would be uh yeah of course you go right to citra that. kush citra kush man all day well if it's got thc in it and cbd in it why, why wouldn't it get you high i guess that's the question it does get you high yeah and so this is like how cool is it like we're now growing and like and you know um i uh because i'm writing about this stuff in the new interpreting book i i did get the breeder of this hop um, cannabis hybrid on the phone and I did about this I got the whole backstory all the different genetics went down where it went down how it happened um, so I'm writing about all of that in my new book um, are you gonna drop the, his name yeah yeah in locations and all those things so you gotta um, get the book yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, um, but he confirmed that the purpose of this right? Like he wasn't trying to produce a new species of plant, you know, to get on the cover of National Geographic. But I think that could be, uh, that could, this could be, uh, that could be one of those things. His goal was to try to do something similar uh, to the ABC genetic, right? Can, it, can you produce a cannabis plant um, that produces cannabis incognito? So that Becky next door, and the sheriff across the street don't notice that you've got ganja growing in your yard, right? That, that's kind of, and that was his goal, right? What could I produce hops that could grow as a hops plant that just so happened to be cannabinoid rich in, in, in a way in which I could smoke it? So could I just grow a big hop vine on the side of my house and just not have to deal with plant counts or if it's medical is it legal do i have a license for it it's like fuck it fuck everything i'm just gonna grow a vine up the side of my house and if it gets me high well then you can come over for my backyard barbecue and try some of my hops <laughs> vine so that's uh, i've confirmed that that was the do, do they also fu function like hops like can you make beer from them you know what? I, I have no idea why you wouldn't be able to. And um, I need to get my hands on this genetic and work with it because I, I need to explore a lot of these things. Um, but it there it's weird. I my understanding of it is you, you know the uh, um, the plant that produces gin, juniper, Jesus. You know that juniper is either a tree or a bush. And like when you're out in the mountains of Colorado, you see juniper bushes, and then you also see juniper trees. It's really interesting. Um, I think half of these hybrids are more hop-like, and they grow more vines that produce cones that, that have trichomes on them that are cannabinoid rich. And I think the others produce bushes that are more like cannabis plants that grow more bud um, and so the the ones that are more like hot plants that grow more like vines I would have to imagine you could brew um, as as cannabrew which is a name that I federally trademarked in 2009 when I thought I was gonna 
produce cannabis beer instead of starting a cannabis education company, which sometimes I still wonder, which I should have done. <laughs> That's cool, man. Very, very cool. I like it. I'm, uh, I'll be checking out the book when it comes out and we'll see, uh, we'll, we'll go deeper into this. I'm sure Nick Ziegler would have been very interested to hear this today. I'll have to send him the link later. Um, I did want to share a couple of uh, your shots, Best Friend Farmer. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about these shots, dude, because I've really been enjoying these shots. Uh, you're making these like dessert-like shots that you're taking on your Instagram. What's, what's, what's going on here? Oh, that one. Oh, I can look at it. That's a 120 micron gas mask, uh, indoor air dried hash rosin cake on that one with a beehive stamp dude it's just lovely this one also i was just like thank you yeah i like that one a lot that's kind of like i was on this comfort food kind of tip you know where i was even going back to the foods that my mom made growing up with it's kind of eerie almost how closely connected and personal the hash is to me and those type of foods which i don't really eat anymore but I'm gluten free for five years, so I, I'd have to go GF. But um, that okay. one is actually. Apparently, Colin likes this too. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an apple cider donut. It. Yeah, Colin actually, I think, was the one that said it looked like an apple cider donut with uh, maple awesome. glazing on it. Yeah. Even the... That one is. Uh... On the outside? What's that? rosin all along the outside it's all just so well done yeah very you know, great. oh thank you you know I, I i did that by just personal sorry go ahead oh i just i had fun with that one right there man that was like all of these i actually did by hand a couple of them on a sunday even and just kind of like escape from all the industry stuff which is so involving and I, you know, to kind of go back to some artistic touch on it, stuff I like to do. And I just kind of had fun with the smear and, and the, yeah, I remember doing it, kind of just like drawing almost and, and just had fun with it. And I, I have it with me here. I can show you the actual scale size. Yeah, yeah. Show us the actual scale size, but also like, what do you got? You got like a rosin splotch along the bottom and then you got like a bubble donut with some like diamonds and sauce poured over it or something like what? Oh man, so so that's a 90 uh, micron air dried whole plant cured flower indoor bubble hash for the the actual donut, and then that's a 90 micron air dried whole plant fresh frozen. That's some air dried fresh frozen. I get a lot of the the tannin richness on my air dry, but it's just as saucy. It'll never go stable. It's just sauce, and then it's all it's all in line gas mask all three, and then I got a 120 micron. Again, air dried whole plant cured flour crumble on the sieve portion. So that's just like some chunk that we didn't zap, didn't press. And kind of the cool thing is with air dried is we're seeing some different texture and tannin richness uh, differences that you don't really get when you have just fresh frozen or freeze dried. So kind of fun. We're actually applying some of the darker tannin stuff and it's, None of it's BS, though. It's all melty. I'd, I'd like to melt the whole donut sometime Let's and try to share the video. Let's see the size of it. All right. I got it right here. The donut's actually pretty small. Pulls out a bunt cake. <laughs> Look at this thing. Sorry for my dirty farmer hands. I definitely have my dirty farmer hands. Oh, it's, it's All the good. Size of a oh, life I have saver. that so bad. I just can imagine I'm going to do it right now. That is absolutely awesome. I want to do just the this last one. That's my cookie, though, guys. That's a one ounce right there. Oh, I haven't. Uh, I'm just about to hit your cookie right now. So let's look at it on the screen. What the hell? Like, how come you're not my neighbor? I just actually added you to my Instagram. I can't even wait. What, what about me. this one before? The <laughs> Jesus. What's, that's the whoopie pie. That's like some comfort food from home from mom. 
do the scale. I got to dig it up. It's tiny. I did a couple micros, kind of like making micro models type thing, you know, too. It's so fun, like art fun. And then this guy's fun. Oh, wow. I just have to say, you to 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 runs. Okay. if you talk, <laughs> if you talk, then it'll go on you, but it'll, it was on me first and then it went on to John. So show that again, but also talk. Talk. All right. So this one here, oops, I'm having a hard time showing it. I'm trying. There it is. That's your guy. It's been kind of pressed up in the parchment. I just tried to preserve them. I might auction them off at a local dispensary friend's shop um, for benefit or something. But like I'm going to make more. Pie. That's, looks like that's a Amish whoopie pie. pie. Call them out <laughs> yeah, I don't know what, you, what they call them down there, but that's what we call them up here, a whoopie pie. Whoopie pie, yeah. Yes, so that one is actually gas mask in the middle for a rosin. I think that's a 120 micron air dried indoor. And then those were some Hascap, which was Sunday is Sunday brunch by Great Pie on some broad spectrum air dried stuff, you know, kind of wider broad spectrum. And that's the cookie. That's the scale. And I can show you guys again. The cookie amazed me how much it looks like an unbaked cookie. It's kind of crazy. There's that guy. What are the chocolate chips made out of? Chocolate chips are a broad spectrum also, kind of like a wider uh, broad spectrum from trim hash, bubble hash, all air dried and kind of long air dry on that stuff, maybe even up to like three weeks. So it's got the tannin richness to it. And then I'll just check myself real quick to make sure because it's been a minute. Um, so the chips are two grams. They're a quarter gram each, and it's gas mask, actually, broad spectrum air dried from the trim and the littles. And then the cookie was a 26 gram gas mask, 90 micron air dried. And it was just this bubble hash that on the gas mask cultivar is one of those that speaks to the real blonde, creamy, greasy hash. And I've talked about it before. It's just one of those special hash plants. And it kind of retains its creaminess and, and greasy feel even later on. It still has the, the cookie still has it right now. So it sounded well, like thanks were, for, yeah, thanks. when you were like describing what these different things were, I was just laughing because it just sounded like such just, <laughs> I don't know. I love it, man. That was great. It, like, you are it's fun. Guy. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun. True artist. Yeah, I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you so much. I think someone in many ways. Someone should do a book on like hash that looks like desserts and foods and your pictures could be highlighted in that because when I saw them last week, I wanted to kind of go over them, but then you were having internet problems or whatever you had to go and I didn't bring it up sooner. Yeah. Enough. By the time I did bring it up, you no, I'm, ha I'm really happy the farming didn't take over so much that I could come in today and actually get the technology right too because I'm very analog. So this is cool. And um, I'd love to share, show more of them for sure. The, that's one from way back. And I was going to bring that up to mention that one of the things that motivated me besides the comfort food connection, art thing and love for hash was that people just kept dropping bombs for comments on the Instagram when it came to these type of hash things from the air drive that we were doing that we make. And it kind of just really struck me to where why not make these food items specifically in design towards you know looking like that that food and hash connection there's definitely something there just like with the with the terpene talk that we're doing I was eating some chocolate and as I grabbed up a piece of I thought was chocolate was hash I started eating it and I realized that oh, wow so when you're saying now they look like the chocolate chips I'm like I got a chocolate chip just it was awesome I've almost eaten a few of the pieces they just look tasty 
Well, they are. You could just like break off a little like chocolate. That looks like creme brulee. That's what I've heard before on that. That's some bubble cream right there. A recent gas mask again. These are uh, concentrate confections. It's wild. It's wild. The connection, it just seems to be there already. And that's some good classic kind of broad spectrum stuff right there, too, I think. Gentlemen, I've got some uh, mycology to attend to. I'm going to go bake some horse shit in my oven before the fiance gets home. It's her favorite. Good call. Good call. <laughs> <laughs> but you guys rock. Thanks so much for having me back. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Max. Always a pleasure, man. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon. See you guys. See you, Max. Thanks for the learning. Yeah, bye, guys. Yeah, that was mad fun. I uh, I should get going here soon as well. I really did enjoy the hash confectionery um, quarterly that we just did. Let's uh, let's inspire more of you to take a book out of a page out of Best Friend Farms book and produce some really cool dessert-looking hashes. I'm telling you, like I don't do books, but there's I'm down. Yeah, someone do a book, man. I want that book. Like, and, and the photos need to be high quality so you can put them on a, on a very nice size, very high quality paper, you know, coffee table book, hash dabbing book. Oh man, I'm way down. Hit me up on it. I'm gonna make more hash food in the meanwhile. Yeah, Still sweets, but I got a few ideas. also make nice postcards and you don't say what they really are. You just give them some uh, food name <laughs> totally yeah it's true it's all true well listen everybody thanks for coming out for hash church episode 23 today i superly appreciate each and every one of you uh let's try and do it again next week i'll try to give people more forewarning than uh a couple of hours so thanks everybody peace out thank you thank you mark